grace and peace in Jesus. Last week, we focused on the word of God and, and not taking it for granted. And the verses we looked at talked about how the word was living and active, like a double-edged, sharper than a double-edged sword, not to be taken for granted. And so there was the encouragement to, to be in the word, take it seriously. Well, today we have another great blessing from God that we don't want to take for granted, that also can be taken for granted. And that is the access that we have to the Father. That we stand in the presence of God with no fear. We walk into the throne room of the Almighty. That we don't have to conjure God or, or get his attention or convince him to listen to us or show ourselves worthy of the things we ask for. No. We have access, peace in the presence of God. Not something to be taken for granted. But why do we have this? Well, the writer of the letter to the Hebrews would say, because Jesus is our great high priest. And that's our focus today. That's what he was getting at in the verses that, that Dove just read. Jesus, our great high priest. So let's take a look at that. I'm going to read through the, the same reading, uh, Hebrews 4.14 to 5.10. We're going to be jumping around a bit um, and, and, and we just try to unpack what, what the writer is saying here about the access we have because of Jesus, our high priest. First, the, the main bulk of this section is 4.14 to 16, the first three verses. Let me read it again. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus, the high priest. Now, as I said before the service, we're entering a new major section of the letter to the Hebrews. This is like the, the meat of the sandwich that Hebrews is. The next several chapters, up through chapter 10, focusing on Jesus, the high priest, the sacrifice, the temple, and what it all means. It's a very rich section in understanding the Old Testament worship in light of what Jesus, who Jesus is and what he's done. So we're getting kind of an overview in these verses here. We're going to be going much deeper in upcoming, upcoming weeks. But the point for us today is because Jesus is our high priest, we have access. We can approach God with confidence. Okay, but to, to get at this, though, we got to understand some terms. What's a high priest? Unlike the, uh, the folks that he was first writing to, he could uh, assume there is some familiarity with priesthood, it's not this type of high priesthood offering sacrifices. That's not something that we're used to. We don't offer animals here in worship. So let's, let's define. And fortunately, that's what the writer does. Moving ahead into chapter 5, the next four verses, he is defining what an Old Testament Levitical high priest is. Because even some of his readers we're Gentiles, and they might be thinking of pagan priesthood. He wants to define what he means. So, Hebrews 5, 1 to 4, he says this, Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He's able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. So, four big things he's mentioning about the high priest. One is that he's just one of the people. He's not on a higher plane, higher worthiness. He's one of the people. Secondly, his job is to stand as a representative of the people, especially regarding gifts and offerings. Third... Going back to the theme, he's just one of the people. He's got his own problems. He's got his own weaknesses. So he can understand that we're all weak and we all fall down because he does that too. And so he's got to offer sacrifices for himself as well as for the people. And four, that nobody just decides, hey, I think I'm going to be a priest. I think I'm going to be a high priest. No, you've got to be appointed by God. 
And in the Old Testament, the way God laid it out, the appointment was through the family you're born into. All the priests were of the family of Aaron. Okay. So he lays this out, and then the rest of the verses 5 to 10, he's pointing out how Jesus meets the qualifications. Jesus is a high priest. And especially what he's, going to point, he's pointing to, I'm not going to read it all right now, is how Jesus is indeed appointed by the Father as high priest. Big point, because Jesus was not of the family of Aaron. And yet he was appointed by God directly. And he quotes a couple of passages from the Old Testament to show that, including that Jesus is high priest not in the order or family of Aaron, but in the family and order of Melchizedek. Okay, Melchizedek. We're not going to delve into Melchizedek this week, okay? Um, he's going to spend a lot more time talking about Melchizedek in chapter 7. So we're going to hold off on that. So just don't worry about Melchizedek right now. Right now. Um, just the point here is Jesus is a high priest appointed directly by God, even though he's not of the family of Aaron. Okay, so now we've, we, we've, we've covered what is a high priest. Jesus is one. We go back to chapter 4, back to 14 to 16, and now let's dig in more deeply now that we, we, we get that. Verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven... Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Okay, here he is again. And if you've been with us on this journey, this is the big theme of the letter to the Hebrews. Be faithful. Don't fall away. Hold firmly. And remember again what they're dealing with. He was writing to a church facing persecution. And so they were dealing with the temptation to fall away, to go back to their pagan religion, or to go back to their Israelite Jewish religion, which was legal in the Roman Empire, unlike Christianity at this time. It would be easier to leave. It would be safer to leave. It would be economically and socially advantageous to walk away from the faith. So there's this temptation. And let me tell you, this is what our brothers and sisters in parts of China, India, parts of Africa, and the Middle East are dealing with all the time. It would be easier on their lives to walk away. He's saying, hold on, hold on. Now, I've pointed out, we're in a different circumstance. We don't live under that threat of, of persecution, but there's all kinds of things that are leading people to fall away. In fact, there are more falling away from the church in America than in those places I just talked about. Because we're too busy. Because it doesn't seem relevant. Because church isn't very entertaining. For a number of reasons. Or because church has let me down. Or church people have treated me badly. A number of reasons. People falling away. So the temptation is with us as well. This is very relevant to us. So the writer to the Hebrews now in this section is giving us another reason to hold firm. This has been his theme throughout this book. Hold firm because Jesus is truly God. Hold firm because he's superior to angels. Hold firm because he is superior to Moses. Hold firm because bad things happen to the Israelites who did not hold firm in the wilderness. Hold firm because it's the word of God, which is a sharp sword. And now we got a new one. Hold firm to the faith because Jesus is the great high priest who has given us access. And this is one he's going to spend of some time talking about. Okay. Verse 15, going on. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. As he pointed out, a high priest is one of the people. Jesus is one of us. He is fully, completely, totally human at the same time that he's God. But he's totally human. That means he was subject to temptation. Now, maybe not the exact same temptations that you and I deal with in their specificity. I mean, Jesus never faced the temptation of exceeding the speed limit in his car or, or faced the temptation of 
downloading pirated movies. I mean, no. But the categories of temptation, greed, envy, lust, hate, pride, all of them. He experienced them all. Satan made sure of it. He was tempted in every way, all those different ways, all those categories. And we really need to take this to heart. Jesus' divinity does not mean he wasn't tempted. He struggled with it. But I think the letter writer, the writer of the Hebrews, has one particular temptation in mind in writing this. The temptation to fall away. The temptation to walk away from the faith. The temptation to unfaithfulness. Did Jesus deal with that temptation? Oh, yeah. I mean, that was the essence of what Satan was doing in the wilderness, tempting him to walk away. And this was what he was struggling with in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he is struggling, tearing, just torn up between doing what he has been called faithfully to do and being fearful of what it would entail. And so he prays to the Father, please take this away. If there's any way, take it away. And he's so agonized over this struggle and dealing with his temptation, he's sweating blood. Did Jesus know this temptation? Yeah, he certainly did. He certainly did. As he pointed out, uh, after the arrest to Peter, after Peter cut off the high priest's servant's ear, he says, don't you know, Peter? Like that, I can have 12 legions of angels here to get me out of this? But you've got to believe, while he's saying that, he's thinking, yeah, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. The temptation is there. And the temptation would have been there while he's in this trial and being lied about and, and condemned and falsely accused, while he's being whipped and tortured, while he's carrying the cross, while he's going to the cross, being nailed there and hanging there, being mocked by the people, knowing that at any moment, with just a thought, he could just walk away and it would all be over. Tempted in every way, yet did not sin. He was faithful. Faithful. And because of that, we are saved. Now, before we get into verse, chapter 4, verse 16, which is the big theme for this whole section, 416, we've got to jump again to chapter 5 and look in a little more closely at verses 7 to 10, which are about this, what happened on the cross and what does it mean. So I'm going to jump ahead to verse 7 of chapter 5. And, and speaking of Jesus, the writer says, Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. Now, maybe when you heard Dove reading that, you're going, what? Does this mean Jesus was disobedient and he had to learn how to behave? No. No, what, what's, what's, what's in view here is learning by experiencing the blessing of radical obedience to the Father, even to the point of death. Some things are really only learned as you live them. I mean, take this as an example. Before you have children, you could read 10 books on parenting and go to 13 seminars, but you don't know, right? Because there's a whole different dimension of experiencing what it means to be a parent. So I learned parenting by having three children. It doesn't mean I was a bad parent before. It means that experience. So he, Jesus learned the value of radical obedience and faithfulness to the Father through what he suffered by going to the point of death and rising again. And by doing it, by being faithful radically to the point of death, saving the world. Wow. Radical obedience is good. He learned it by his experience. And then going on, and once made perfect... Is that implying he wasn't perfect? Not in the way we might be thinking about it. Perfect here means complete, finished, done, all complete. For instance, I'm a painter, and I'm painting a painting, and I'm, I'm half done. Okay, the painting is, quote, imperfect. It's not that it's a bad painting. It's just not done yet. 
Jesus' painting wasn't done until he completed his work, died on the cross, and rose again. So once made perfect, completing his painting, what was the result? He became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. This is the obedience worked by faith. Because of what he did, seeing it through to completion, completing his work, as it's going to be unpacked in upcoming chapters, being the high priest who offered the perfect sacrifice, which was himself. He completed the work of eternal salvation. And once again, designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek, which we'll talk about in a few weeks. Okay. So, okay, now we're ready for chapter 4, verse 16. Our main verse Go back to 416. And this is our memory verse for this week as well. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. This is why we have access, why we can approach with confidence because of what our high priest has done, who he is, what he has done. He completed the job, he kept faithful, he was obedient. And now we can approach with confidence. This is the, the point we don't want to take for granted. You see, in, in the ancient world, you didn't have access to the king or the Caesar or the emperor. You couldn't just walk into the throne room and say, I got a problem. Can you fix it for me? You could not do it. I mean, could we do that today? Could, could, could you walk into the governor's office tomorrow or the Oval Office or any head of state or, or, or you know, a big corporate CEO? No, we don't have access. I'll think about, though, apply this to the God, access to the God of the universe, the creator of all things, before whom we are accountable and against whom we have sinned. Access? Walk right on in with confidence? You see, the whole Old Testament worship sacrificial system and the architecture of the temple was all designed to emphasize you do not have access. You are not worthy. The temple itself, only the priests were allowed inside. The average person who wasn't a priest never saw the inside of the temple. No access. And inside the temple, the holy of holies, where the ark was, the, the, if you will, the earthly throne room of God, only the high priest had access. And then only once a year. And then only after he offered a sacrifice for his own sin. A great big thick curtain separated the holy of holies from the rest of the temple. Saying, you do not have access. You are not worthy. So only the priest in the temple, the commoners outside, the Gentiles even further away. But then we got a new high priest, Jesus, who offered the perfect sacrifice himself. And because of that, because he was faithful and endured the temptation, did not fall away, completed his work, we have access. At the moment of Jesus' death, that curtain in the temp temple separating the Holy of Holies was torn in two. Is God saying, come on in. You have access. Sacrifice has been made. Sin is atoned for. Come in. Come in. And we have access now. We have access. The temple is wide open, the throne room. We can approach the king anytime, covered in the righteousness of Jesus. No fear, no having to conjure him, no having to prove anything to him. Think of, think of the difference, the radical difference, going from that old system in which you did not have access to here we are worshiping, confident that we are in the presence of God, and in a few minutes, he will come to us in bread and wine and body and blood for us to eat and drink. You are in the Holy of Holies. And it is in you. That's access. So again, 416, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Are you in a time of need? 
any type of need, any type of need. He's saying, come on in. Approach with confidence, no fear. Because of what Jesus has done, our great high priest, you have access. You see, this priesthood of Jesus, and we'll be, like I said, unpacking it over the next couple of, of, of weeks, few weeks. This is not just a historical point about the fulfillment of an obsolete worship system. It's this. We are at peace with God. He is with us and for us. He wants to hear our prayers and he will answer. Let's pray. What a blessing, Lord, when we dare not take for granted that because of Jesus, our high priest, we can approach you always right up to the throne with confidence, knowing that in you, in our time of need, we will find mercy and grace. Lord, give us every day confidence and faith to live in this truth. In Jesus' name, amen.